Helen Hayes, starring in A Farewell to Arms by Ernest Hemingway. This is the Ford Theater. <laughs> dramatic entertainment with celebrated stars of Broadway and Hollywood is presented by the Ford Motor Company, builder of Ford cars, Ford trucks, motor coaches and farm tractors, and Lincoln and Mercury cars. Owners say the 1949 Mercury is the smartest car they ever drove, the smartest buy they ever made. Now to introduce tonight's program, here is the director of the Ford Theater, Fletcher Markle. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you one of the most memorable emotional experiences in American storytelling. Mr. Ernest Hemingway's A Farewell to Arms first appeared in 1929, and except for three years, there has been war of some kind ever since, which is reason enough for offering our version for listening to Mr. Hemingway's story at this time. And tonight, we're not only pleased and fortunate to have a great story for you, we're also very proud to have with us in the Ford Theater a great actress. One of the most dazzling talents in the American theater, Miss Helen Hayes. Miss Hayes will be playing Catherine Barkley, the role she created for motion pictures. And with her, you'll be hearing Everett Sloan as Rinaldi, Hester Sondergaard as Ferguson. And I'm going to remain at the microphone with them to tell the story of Lieutenant Frederick Henry, an American serving in the ambulance corps of the Italian army in 1916. Please to begin. <laughs> summer of that year, we lived in a house in a village that looked across the river and the plain to the mountains. The Austrians were there in the north, and all day and all night, Italian troops and big guns pulled by motor tractors went by the house and down the road. There were many victories, but one day the snow came very fast, and suddenly it was winter, and we knew it was all over for that year. None of the mountains beyond the river had been taken. That was all left for the offensive next year. I went on a long leave, and when I came back to the front, we still lived in that town. There were many more guns in the country around, and the spring had come. The room I shared with Lieutenant Rinaldi, a surgeon in the Italian Medical Corps, looked out on a courtyard. The window was open, and there was a breeze from the sea. Rinaldi had been asleep when I came in, but he woke when he heard me in the room and got up and put his arms around my neck and kissed me. Oh, baby, you look fine. What kind of a time did you have? Magnificent. Where did you go and what did you do? Tell me everything at once. Well, I went everywhere. Milan, Florence, Rome, Naples, Messina. Did you have any beautiful adventures? Yes. Where? Milan, Florence, Rome, Naples. Oh, that's enough. Tell me, really, what was that? In Milan. <laughs> that was because it was first. But here now we have beautiful girls. English girls. Never been to the front before. No. You don't believe me, huh? We will go now this afternoon and see. English girls. I am now in love with Miss Barclay. I will take you to call at the British Hospital. I will probably marry Miss Barclay. I have to get washed up and report. Doesn't anybody work now? Next week the war starts again. They say so. The winter is over. You will come with me to see Miss Barclay? No. Oh, yes, Betty. You will please come and make a good impression on her. All right. Wait till I get cleaned up. Wash up and come as you are. Ah, wait. We should have a drink. Not straight. No, no. Grab her. All right. Pass. What are you? What do you mean? Another, eh? Then I will take you to see Miss Barclay. All right. All right. Have you got any money, baby? Yes. Good. Loan me 50 lira. The British hospital was a big villa built by the Germans before the war. Miss Barclay was in the garden with another nurse. Her name was Ferguson. We walked through the trees, Miss Barclay somehow walking with me and Rinaldi ahead with the other nurse. Miss Barclay was blonde and had a tawny skin and gray eyes, and she carried a thin rattan stick bound in leather like a riding crop. I thought she was very beautiful. You're not an Italian, are you? Oh, no. <clears throat> I'm an American. What an odd thing to be in the Italian army. Oh, it's not really the army. It's only the ambulance. Just that I was in Italy when it started, and I speak Italian. It's very odd, though. Why'd you do it? I don't know. There isn't always an explanation for everything. Oh, isn't there? I was brought up to think there was. Oh. What's that stick you're carrying? It belonged to a boy who was killed last year. Oh, I'm awfully sorry. He's a very nice boy. He was going to marry me, and he was killed in the Somme. 
There's not really any sort of war down here, is there? Not yet. His mother sent me the little stick. They returned it with his things. Have you been engaged long? Eight years. We grew up together. Why didn't you marry him? I don't know. I was a fool not to. I could have given him that anyway. But I thought it would be bad for him going away. I see. Have you ever loved anyone? No. Let's sit down on the bench here. All right. You have beautiful hair. Do you like it? Very much. I was going to cut it all off when he died. Oh, no. I wanted to do something for him. He could have had anything he wanted if I'd have known. I would have married him or anything. I know all about it now. But then he wanted to go to war, and I didn't know. I thought it would be worse for him. I thought perhaps he couldn't stand it. And then, of course, he was killed, and that was the end of it. I don't know. Oh, yes, that was the end of it. <laughs> Your friend's a doctor, isn't he? Yes, he's very good. That's splendid. You rarely find anyone any good this close to the front. This is close to the front, isn't it? Quite close. Are they going to have an offensive? Yes. Then we'll have to work. There's no work now. Have you done nursing long? Since the end of 15. Oh. I started when he did. <laughs> I remember having a silly idea he might come to the hospital where I was, with a saber cut, I suppose, and a bandage around his head, something picturesque. <laughs> this is a picturesque front. You suppose it will always go on? No. What's to stop it? Oh, it'll crack somewhere. Do we have to go on and talk this way? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's a relief, isn't it? After a while, we said goodnight and left. Walking home, Rinaldi said... Miss Barclay prefers you to me. That is very clear. But the other one is very nice. Very. You like her? No. The next evening, I went to call on Miss Barclay again at the British Hospital. She was sitting on a bench in the garden. Miss Ferguson was with her. They seemed glad to see me, but in a little while, Miss Ferguson got up to go. I'll leave you two. You get along very well without me. Don't go, Helen. I'd really rather. I must write some letters. <clears throat> Good night, Sam. Good night, Mr. Henry. Don't write anything that'll bother the censor. Don't worry. I only write about what a beautiful place we live in and how brave the Italians are. That way you'll be decorated. That will be nice. Good night, Jeff. I'll see you in a little while, Ferguson. I don't think Ferguson likes me very much. Oh, nonsense. He's very nice. He's a nurse. Aren't you a nurse? Oh, no. I'm something called a VAD. We work very hard, but no one trusts us. Why not? I suppose because we're volunteers. The Italians didn't want women so near the front, so we're all on very special behavior. We're not allowed out. I can come here, though. Oh, yes. We're not cloistered. Let's drop the war. It's very hard. There's no place to drop it. Let's drop it anyway. No, please don't. You're on. Why not? I want to kiss you. No. Here, please. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to slap you. You're quite right. I'm dreadfully sorry. I just couldn't stand the nurse's evening off aspect of it. I hurt you, didn't I? Oh, you did exactly right. I don't mind at all. Poor man. You see, I've been leading a sort of a funny life here. And you're so very beautiful. You don't need to say a lot of nonsense. I said I was sorry. We do get on. <laughs> we have gotten away from the war. <laughs> so sweet. No, I'm not. Yes, you are a dear. I'd, I'd be very glad to kiss you. If you don't mind. I looked in her eyes and put my arm around her as I had before and kissed her. I kissed her hard, and as I held her, suddenly she shivered. I held her close against me, and I could feel her heart beating, and her head went back against my hand, and then she was crying. Oh, darling, you will be good to me, won't you? Isn't there anywhere we can go? No, we have to just stay here. You did say you loved me, didn't you? Yes. Say I love you. And you will call me Catherine? Catherine. This is a rotten game we play, isn't it? What game? You're a nice boy and you play it as well as you know how, but it's a rotten game. <laughs> you always know what people think? Not always, but I do with you. You don't have to pretend you love me. That's over for the evening. There's something else you'd like to talk about? But I do love you. Please, let's not lie when we don't have to. Catherine. It sounds very funny. Catherine. Not the way he said it. You don't pronounce it very much alike. But you're very good. And you will come and see me. Of course. You don't have to say you love me. That's all over for a while. Good night. I want to kiss you. You want to very much? Yes. All right. We walked to the...
the door and I saw her go in and down the hall. I liked to watch her move. I went on home. It was a hot night and there was a good deal going on up in the mountain. I watched the gun flashing on San Gabriela and I went up to my room. So, you make progress with Miss Barkley, eh, baby? Oh, we're friends. You have that smug air of a cat with a mouth full of canary. And you have the air of an ignorant, uninformed Italian oaf. Good night. <laughs> Good night, little kitten. <laughs> The next afternoon, we heard there was to be an attack up the river that night and that we were to take four ambulances there. I was riding in the first car, and as we passed the entry to the British hospital, I told my driver to stop. I hurried up the driveway, and inside the reception hall, I asked for Miss Barkley. She was on duty, and they sent an orderly to find her, and she came back with him, and we stepped outside. I wasn't expecting you until tonight. I'm leaving now for a show up above Plava. An attack? Oh, it's all right. I don't think it's anything. And you'll be back? Tomorrow. Here. Please take this. It's a St. Anthony. <laughs> they, they say St. Anthony's very useful. I'll uh, take care of him for you. And come tomorrow night. Yes. Goodbye. No, oh. not goodbye. All right. You'll be a good boy and be careful. Catherine. No. Oh, no, you can't kiss me here. You can't. All right. Tomorrow night. We drove very fast, and soon we saw the dust of the other three cars ahead of us, and Manera, my driver, settled back and began to talk. Ferente, there is nothing as bad as war. We in the Earth Ambulance cannot even realize how bad it is. We went along the rough new military road that followed the crest of a ridge, and I looked to the north at the two ranges of mountains, green and dark to the snow line, and then white and lovely in the sun. Those were all the Austrian mountains, and we had nothing like them. When people realize how bad war is, they cannot do anything to stop it because they go crazy. There were many troops on the road, and motor trucks and mules with mountain guns. And as we went down, keeping to the side, I could see the river far down below. And under a hill beyond the river, the broken houses of the little town that was to be taken. Some people never realize how bad war is. The sun was going down when we reached our rendezvous point. The road there was below the level of the river bank, and all along the sides there were holes dug in the bank with infantry in them. We parked the cars, and I reported to the major. If this thing goes well, Lieutenant, I will see that you are decorated. I said I hoped it would go well, because he was too kind. And then I went to the big dugout for my driver to this place. Oh, this is going to be a dirty mess, eh, Tenente? Yes, they will kill us with very little teasing. Well, they will surely try, Gordini. Tenente, what if we take San Gabriel? What if we take the car from Montfalcon? Where are we there? Did you see all the far mountains today? Yeah, I saw them. Do you think we could take all them too? Only if the Austrians stop fighting. One side must stop fighting. Why don't we stop fighting? Yes, if the Austrians come down on the Italy, they'll get tired and go away. They have their own country, but no, instead there is a war. Oh, you're an orator, Pacini. <laughs> <laughs> we sing, we read. We are not peasants, we are mechanics. But even the peasants know better than to believe in a war. Everybody hates this war. There is a class that controls a country that is stupid and does not realize anything and ever can. Also, they make money out of it. Most of them don't, Gavuch, yeah? It is, as Manera says, they are too stupid. They do it for nothing, for stupidity. Eh, we must shut up. We talk too much even for Tenente. Do we eat yet, Tenente? No, go and see. Is there anything I can do, Tenente? Can I help in any way? Come with me if you want, Manera. Of course. It was dark outside, and the long light from the searchlights was moving over the mountains. It was quiet as we crossed the brickyard to the main dressing station where the Major was sitting at a field telephone. And as we returned to the dugout with food, from all the guns behind us, the bombardment started. <laughs> Starting now. Now is the trouble. Hi, 420. No, there aren't any 420s in the mountains. They have big scotter guns. That's in the hole. 305, Cassini. Uh, this is in the deep dugout. That was a big trench mortar. Yes, sir. Oh! Santa Maria! Santa Maria! After the blast and the pain oh, and the floating lights, I heard somebody crying. I tried stop to move, it. but I couldn't move. I heard the machine guns stop and rifles it. firing across the river. All this stop in a moment. Up. And then the crying came close. Santa Maria! It was Pacini. When I touched him, he screamed. His legs were toward me, and I saw that they were both smashed above the knees. Then he was quiet and unmoving and dead. Now there were three others to locate. I sat up. My legs felt warm and wet, and my shoes were wet and warm inside. I knew that I was hit and leaned over and put my hand on my knee. My knee wasn't there. It was down on my shin. I wiped my hand on my shirt and another floating light came very slowly down and I looked at my legs and was very afraid. Salente. Someone took hold of me under the arms and somebody else lifted my legs. Salente. 
three others, Manero. One is dead. This is Manero, Tenente. We went to put his pressure, but there was not any. How are you? Where is Gordini and Gavuzzi? Gordini's at the post, getting bandaged. Gavuzzi has your leg. Yes. Hey, hold tight to my neck now, Tenente. Are you badly hit? In the leg. Oh, it's Gordini. Yes, all right. With a big French motor fan. Oh, is dead. Yes. He's dead. Oh, I'm sorry, Tenente. Hang on to my neck. If, if you drop me again... It was because we were scared. Are you all wounded? We were both wounded later. Can Gordini drive? I don't think so. Oh, God. I'm sorry, Tenente. We won't drop you again. In the ward at the field hospital, they told me a visitor was coming to see me in the afternoon. It was a hot day and there were many flies in the room. Lying on the cot in my dirty bandages, I thought about Catherine seeing my name on the wounded list. I could easily guess what Ferguson would say. It was very obvious to me what Ferguson would be saying. I knew it. Oh, I knew it. Already he's been wounded. You're going to be sorry about this, Catherine. There can be worse trouble than this and you'll be sorry. Oh, stop it, Ferguson. No, you're talking that way. This time he's been wounded. Next time he may never come back. Never isn't a pretty word. Sometimes you can't use pretty words. Don't go on with this, Catherine. You'll never know about him. You can never be sure. Oh, Fergie, stop it now. No one ever knows anything or is sure of anything in a war. Men go to the front. Some of them come back. Some of them don't. Women can't expect to have any more luck than the men. Very simple, after all. It's a dreadful thing, a terrible way for women to live, but there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. I don't understand why you're talking like this. That's very simple, too, Fergie. I'm in love with him. I'm in love with him, and there's absolutely nothing I can do about it. Now here's Act Two of tonight's Ford Theater production of A Farewell to Arms, starring Helen Hayes as Catherine Barkley, with Fletcher Markle as Lieutenant Henry. My visitor that first painful afternoon in the field hospital was Rinaldi. And he came in very fast and bent down over the bed and kissed me. How are you, baby? How do you feel? I bring you a bottle of cognac and good news. You will be decorated. Huh? What for? Because you are gravely wounded. Tell me exactly what happened. Did you do any heroic act? No, I was blown up while we were eating cheese. Oh, be serious, baby. You must have done something heroic either before or after. Didn't you carry anybody on your back? Cordini says that you I carry... didn't carry anybody. I couldn't move. Well, that doesn't matter. Didn't you refuse to be medically aided before the others? <laughs> Not very firmly. It doesn't matter. It was all a great success. Did they cross the river? Enormously. How is everything? Splendid. We are all splendid. Everybody is proud of you. And here now is some cognac. Oh, good. There. Drink that, baby. How is your poor head, huh? Uh-oh. I looked at your papers. You haven't any fracture. Only your leg. They would probably have to operate. Ah, that major at the first post was a hard butcher. I would take you and never hurt you. <laughs> you must forgive me for talking so much, baby. I am very moved to see you so badly wounded. The cognac is good, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> it ought to be good. It cost 15 lire. Five stars. Ronaldo, have you seen Miss Barkley? I will bring her to you. I will go now and arrange it. You are going to be taken to the new American hospital at Milan, you know. Oh, don't go yet. Tell me about things. Oh, I wish you were going to be back with me, baby. No one to come in at night from adventure. No one to make fun of. No one to lend me money. <laughs> we are war brothers and we love each other. You'll be good while I'm gone. I will arrange to send Miss Barkley to Milan. You are better for her than me. You are purer and sweeter. And you're an ignorant, frozen face, no account son of Oh, don't be angry, baby. Laugh, laugh. Take another drink. I must go, really. Kiss me goodbye. You're sloppy. No, I'm just more affectionate. But I won't kiss you if you don't want. 
I will send your English girls to Milan. Goodbye, baby. The cognac is under the bed. <laughs> The next day in the morning, I left for Milan. It was a bad trip. The pain went on and on, and I could feel it going in and out of the bone. Everything was new at the hospital, and they were not prepared for wounded yet. There was no room ready, and the doctor was in Lake Como, and no one knew anything about a Miss Barkley. I slept badly with the pain, but when I woke in the morning, I heard someone coming along the hall, and the door opened. It was Catherine. She stood there for a moment. She looked fresh and young and very beautiful. When I saw her, I knew that I was really in love with her, and everything turned over inside me. She looked up and down the hall, saw there was no one, and then she came to the side of the bed and leaned over and kissed me. Hello, darling. Oh, sweet. Weren't you wonderful to come here? It wasn't very hard. Rinaldi arranged it. Ferguson and I were transferred together, but I may not be able to stay. Oh, got to stay. You're wonderful. I want to hold you. You mustn't. You're not well enough. Yes, I am. Please. Feel our hearts beating. I don't care about our hearts. Oh, you're lovely. You've got to stay. They can't send you away. I'm crazy in love with you. We'll have to be awfully careful. You'll have to be careful in front of other people. I will. You'll have to be. Now, I must go, darling, really. The doctor's coming. He telephoned from the lab. Oh, when does he get here? He'll be here this afternoon. I'll come back when I can. The doctor decided to operate on my legs the next morning. It was good that Catherine was there. She stayed on duty that night, and it was good to have her near. A breeze came in the night, and we watched the beam of a searchlight move across the sky, and we heard the man of the anti-aircraft gun on the next roof talking. Then I went to sleep. And in the morning, when it was light, Catherine came in looking fresh and lovely and sat on the bed. As the sun rose, we could smell the dew on the roofs of the town. Now, you be careful, darling. You're such a lovely temperature, and we don't want to spoil it. I'm awfully proud of your temperature. <laughs> Maybe all our children will have fine temperatures. Our children will probably have beastly temperatures. <laughs> oh, darling, when you're going under the ether, please think about something else, not us. Because people get very blabby under an anesthetic. Well, what should I think about? Anything, anything but us. Think about your people, or even any other girl. Oh, no. Say your prayers, then. That ought to create a splendid impression. I... I won't talk at all. <laughs> now you're bragging, darling. Just start your prayers when they tell you to breathe deeply. You'll be lovely that way, and I'll be so proud of you. I'm very proud of you anyway. You have such a lovely temperature. You sleep like a little boy with your arm around the pillow and dream of me. Or is it some other girl? Or it's you. I hope so. How many people have you ever loved? Nobody. Not me, even? Oh, yes, you. How many others, really? None. You're lying to me. Yes. <laughs> it's all right. Keep right on lying to me. That's what I want you to do. Were they pretty? I don't know anything about it. You're just mine, that's all. And you've never belonged to anyone else. But I don't care if you have. I'm not afraid of them. But don't tell me about them. Please, darling. Don't ever tell me about them. When I was awake after the operation, I saw sandbags at the end of the bed. They were on pipes that came out of the cast, and there was a strange nurse in the room. And I recognized her. It was Ferguson. How is it now? Oh, better. You did a wonderful job on your knee. How long did it take? Two hours and a half. Did I say anything silly? No, not a thing. Now, don't talk. Just be quiet. Catherine was greatly liked by the nurses because she would do night duty indefinitely. And there was no indication that she would be sent away. I loved her very much, and she loved me. I slept in the daytime, too, and sometimes we wrote notes during the day when we were awake and sent them by Ferguson. How are you feeling today? Oh, fine. I'm writing an important note. Will you come to our wedding, Fergie? You'll never get married. We will. No, you won't. Why not? You'll fight before you marry. Oh, we never fight. You've time yet. We don't fight. Well, you'll die then. Fight or die. That's what people do. They don't marry. Fergie, give me your hand. Don't, don't take hold of me. I'm, I'm not crying. Maybe you'll be all right, you two. But watch out for yourselves. Oh, we will. You're a fine girl, Fergie. I'm not. Don't try to flatter me. How did your leg feel? 
All right. You're a lucky young man. Have you the letter done? I'm going down. We had a lovely time that summer. When I could go out, we went to the cathedral and we rode in a carriage in the park. I remember the carriage, the horse going slowly, and up ahead the back of the driver with his varnished high hat and Catherine sitting beside me. If we let our hands touch just the side of my hand touching hers, we were excited. Oh, darling, I couldn't feel any more married. There isn't any me anymore. I'm you. Don't I make a good wife? You're a lovely wife. You see, darling, I had one experience of waiting to be married. I don't want to hear about it. Ah, you know I don't love anyone but you. You shouldn't mind because someone else loved me. I do. You shouldn't be jealous of someone who's dead when you have everything. Oh, no, but I don't want to hear about it. But, darling, don't worry. I won't ever leave you for someone else. I suppose all sorts of dreadful things will happen to us, but you don't have to worry about that. Yes, and I'll have to go back to the front pretty soon. We won't talk about that until you go. You see, I'm happy, darling, and we're having a lovely time. I haven't been happy for a long while, and when I met you, perhaps I was nearly crazy. Perhaps I was crazy. But now we're happy, and we love each other. You are happy, aren't you? Hmm? Is there anything to do you don't like? Can I do anything to please you? The summer went that way. I don't remember much about the days, except that they were hot and there were many victories in the papers. My legs were healing quickly, and it was not long before I was on crutches and then walking with a cane. One night late in the summer, we were talking softly out on the balcony. There was a mist over the town, and in a little while, the mist turned to rain, and we came in. Soon it was raining hard, and we could hear it drumming on the roof. I got up to see if it was raining in, but it wasn't, so I left the door open. Listen to it. Such a sound. Oh, it's raining very hard now. Darling, you'll always love me, won't you? Of course. And the rain won't make any difference? No. That's good. Because I'm afraid of the rain. Why? I don't know, darling. Always been afraid of the rain. I like it. I like to walk in it. But it's very hard on loving. I love you always. And I love you in the rain and in the snow and in the hail and... What else is there? <laughs> I don't know. You're not really afraid of the rain, are you? Not when I'm with you. Why are you afraid of it? I don't know. Tell me. Don't make me. Tell me. All right. I'm afraid of the rain because sometimes I see me dead in it. Catherine. And sometimes I see you dead in it. Oh, that's more likely. Oh, no, it's not, darling, because I can keep you safe. I know I can. But nobody can help themselves. Oh, please, stop this now. We won't be together much longer. I'll stop it. It's all nonsense. Yes, it's all nonsense. It's all nonsense. It's only nonsense. I'm not afraid of the rain. I'm not afraid of the rain. I... Oh, dear God, I wish I wasn't. In September, the first cool nights came. Then the days were cool and the leaves on the trees in the park began to turn color and we knew the summer was gone. The fighting at the front went very badly and they could not take San Gabriele. My leg was now as well as it would get for a long time. And in October, I got word that I would receive three weeks' convalescent leave and then return to the front. I told Catherine about it as soon as she came off duty that day. Well, that's lovely, darling. Where do you want to go? Oh, nowhere. I want to stay here. Well, that's silly. You pick a place to go and I'll come, too. How will you work here? I don't know, but I will. If necessary, I'll simply leave. <laughs> <laughs> You're such a good girl. Where should we go? I don't care. Anywhere you want. Anywhere we don't know people. Why, don't you care where we go? No. I'll like any place. What's the matter, Catherine? Nothing. Nothing's the matter. Oh, I know there is. Tell me, darling. It's nothing. Tell me. I don't want to. I'm afraid it'll make you unhappy or worry you. No, it won't. You sure? It doesn't worry me, but I'm afraid to worry you. It won't if it doesn't worry you. Do I have to? Yes. I'm going to have a baby, darling. It's almost three months along. You're not worried, are you? Please. Please don't. Oh, I'm not worried only about you. <laughs> That's what you mustn't do. People have babies all the time. Everybody has babies. <laughs> you are a fine girl. No, I'm not. But I try to be a good wife to you. You are. And please don't worry. We'll be all right. And I'll write you every day while you're at the front. And where will you be? I don't know yet, but somewhere splendid. I'll look after that. Well, we should have a drink to all this. <laughs> Would you like a brandy? No, thank you. It only makes me dizzy. But you have one. Didn't you ever drink brandy? <laughs> No, darling. You have a very old-fashioned wife. The night 
I was to return to the front, Catherine and I walked to the Cathedral Square in Milan and had a farewell dinner in a front room in a little hotel at the far end of the square. We drank a bottle of Capri and ate very slowly. And afterwards, Catherine said... Um, it's a fine room. Ah, you're a fine girl. I'm a very simple girl. I didn't think so at first. I know. I was a little crazy. But I wasn't crazy in any complicated manner. I didn't confuse you, did I, darling? <laughs> We have such a fine time now. I don't take any interest in anything else anymore. I'm so happily married to you. Huh? But at my back, I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near. I know that poem. It's by Marvel. But it's about a girl who wouldn't live with a man. It's nearly time to go. How often will you write? Every day. Do they read your letters? Well, they can't read English enough to hurt any. I'll make them very confusing. But not too confusing. I I'm afraid we have to start to go. All right, darling. <laughs> We're never settled anywhere very long, are we? We will be. I'll have a fine home for you when you come back. Maybe I'll be back right... You'll be hurt just a little in the foot. Or the lobe of the ear. No, I want your ears the way they are. And not my feet? Your feet have been hit already. <laughs> <laughs> we have to go, darling, really. All right. You go first. We drove in a carriage to the station in the rain. The rain was clear and transparent against the lights in the station. We stopped, and I turned to Catherine. Her face was in the shadow from the hood of the carriage. It's raining, darling. Yes. But it's a soft rain. We might as well say goodbye. I can't go in? No. Goodbye, Cat. Will you tell the driver to take me back to the hospital? I have already. Goodbye. Take good care of yourself, young Catherine. Yes. Goodbye, darling. I stepped out into the rain and the carriage started. Catherine leaned out and I saw her face in the light and I heard an echo of her voice. Goodbye, darling. She smiled and waved and the carriage went up the street. Goodbye. I wondered if it was goodbye. Often these days, you see a car so beautiful, so big and powerful and luxurious, so handsomely modern, so distinctive, that you turn to watch that 1949 Lincoln Cosmopolitan go by. And that's only natural, because the 1949 Lincolns catch everyone's eye. Each is truly a distinctive car, a car that looks like a million, not a million others. The broad sweeping hood, the flowing lines, the massive power, the quiet luxury, all of those things are part of the Lincoln look. The look that tells you, here is the fine car. And appearance is only part of the story, because back of that distinctive beauty lies superb performance, Lincoln performance, handling ease, sweeping power, and riding comfort that are simply magnificent. The unrivaled performance that can come only from the great new Lincoln V-type eight-cylinder engine. If you are one who insists upon the finest, then you will choose a 1949 Lincoln or 1949 Lincoln Cosmopolitan. And you'll drive it with pleasure on any street or any highway, in any company, anywhere, proudly, secure in the knowledge that you're driving the most distinctive fine car on the road. For Lincoln makes America's most distinctive car. The Ford Theater presentation of A Farewell to Arms will be resumed after a brief pause for station identification. This is CBS. Columbia Broadcasting System. This is KNX Los Angeles. And now we continue tonight's Ford Theater production of A Farewell to Arms, starring Helen Hayes as Catherine Barkley, with Fletcher Markle as Lieutenant Henry. <laughs> Back at the front, the trees were all bare and the roads were muddy. 
We crossed the river, and I saw that it was running high. It had been raining in the mountains. I reported to the major and then went up to the room I shared with Rinaldi. He wasn't in the room, but his things were there. I lay on the bed and thought about Catherine and waited for him. It didn't feel like a homecoming until Rinaldi came in. We talked, and he was very funny. <laughs> well, baby, good old baby, it is fine to have you back. Let me see your knees. That's all right. But I want to see what kind of a job they did in Milan. I do not trust them. There. Look for yourself. Mm. Mm. Is that all the articulation you have? Yes. Oh, it is a crime to send you back, baby. They ought to get complete articulation. Oh, it's a lot better than it was. It was very stiff. Ow! Yes, you ought to have more treatment on it with the machine. But the knee itself is a good job. Now then, tell me more about everything, huh? Oh, there's nothing more to tell. I've led a quiet life. Ah, this war is very depressing. All summer and all fall, I have operated. I never think anymore. I operate. Believe me, baby, I am becoming a lovely surgeon. <laughs> Good. Come. We will have a drink. It's Austrian cognac. Seven stars. This all they captured on San Gabriele. Oh, were you up there? No, I haven't been anywhere. This war is terrible. I've been here all this time operating. Look, baby... This is your toothbrush in class. I kept it all the time to remind me of you. <laughs> I remind you to brush your teeth. No, I have my own, too. Your name. <laughs> I know. You are the fine Anglo-Saxon boy. I know. Here. Thank you. Well, we drink to your English girl. Yes. To Catherine. <laughs> And then one night the wind rose, and at three o'clock in the morning with the rain coming in sheets, there was a great bombardment, and Rinaldi was killed. <laughs> the next night, the Austrians broke through the lines up toward Caporetto, and the order came through to retreat. In the night, going slowly along the crowded roads, we passed troops marching under the rain, horses, wagons, mules, motor trucks, all moving away from the front. At the beginning, the retreat was orderly, wet, and sullen. We moved slowly and haltingly in the rain, the radiator cap of our car close to the tailboard of the truck ahead of us, and there were many stops. Just before dawn, the column stalled and didn't start again for a long time. My driver was exhausted. Ah, we sleep now. My nerves slept, and I was alone, and I heard myself say out loud, Not Catherine. I hope you sleep well. Try and go to sleep, sweet. I was asleep all the time. You've been talking in your sleep. Are you all right? Are you really there? Of course I'm here. I wouldn't go away. This doesn't make any difference between us. Oh, so lovely and sweet. You wouldn't go away in the night, would you? Of course I wouldn't go away. I'm always here. I come whenever you want me. Always. <laughs> Yes, sir, to the gate. Ah, I was dozing. I woke up. You thought that well. Ah, I was having a fine dream. Ah, good, good. And now the retreat lost its order, and it was very wet and cold, and everyone was hungry and weak. Planes came now and bombed the high road. Cars and trucks sank in the mud. And soon nearly everyone around us was lurching along on foot, or lying in the ditches, or hiding, or dead. do not know how long you are in a nightmare like that retreat from Caporetto. It is long and slow and there is no food and no sleep and no time. But when it became rumored that there were Germans in Italian uniforms mixing with the retreat and that many officers were being shot on the merest suspicion by the Italian battle police, I knew that now there had been enough of all of it for me. I deserted the bruised and broken column I'd been moving with. I deserted the Italian army. I deserted the war. Somehow I got to a railway line and climbed aboard a flat car in a freight train going south with guns. I dropped off the train in Milan as it slowed into the station in the early morning. I bought some civilian clothes from a friend and destroyed all of my papers except my old passport. Then I rode out to the American hospital and went to the porter's lodge. 
The porter and his wife were glad to see me. You are back. You are safe. Yes. Tell me, is Miss Barkley here at the hospital now? Miss Barkley? The English lady nurse. This girl. Oh, no, no. She is away. You're sure? I mean the tall, blonde English young lady. Oh, yes. I'm sure she has gone to Tracy. That is true. When did she go? Oh, she went two days ago with the other lady English. I bought a ticket to Strasser and rode through the Lombard country feeling lonely and sad. At Strasser, I went directly to the Grand Hotel where I knew the barman from times when I'd spent leave there. He was surprised to see me. But this is a decision, Dante. What are you doing here? I want leave, Emilio. Convalescing leave. Well, there is almost no one around. I don't know why they keep the hotel open. <laughs> Did you ever get the American tobacco I sent you? Yes, and thank you. It lasted a long time. Good. Tell me, have you seen two English girls in the town they've... Came here day before yesterday. Uh, they are not staying at this hotel, Tenente. They are nurses. One of them is my wife. Oh, yes. I've seen two nurses. They are the little hotel near the station. Oh, I'm glad to hear you are married, Tenente. It was very thrilling to see Catherine again, and we had an evening of great celebration. The following morning, looking out the window of our room at the sunlight on the lake and the mountains beyond, Catherine said, Darling... Won't they arrest you if they catch you out of uniform? They'll probably shoot me. Then we won't stay here. We'll get out of the country. All oh, right. Thought something of that. Yes, we'll get out. Oh, darling, you shouldn't take silly chances. You're liable to be arrested here any time. I won't have it. And where would we be if they took you off? Oh, let's not think about it. I'm tired of thinking about it. I won't let you out of the hotel again until we leave here. Where are we going to go? Please don't be that way, darling. We'll go wherever you say. Switzerland is down the lake. We can go there. That'll be lovely. I wish we didn't have to live like criminals. Darling, don't be that way. You haven't lived like a criminal very long. And we never really live like criminals. We're going to have a fine time. Oh, I feel like a criminal. I deserted from the army. From the war, you mean. You don't really feel like a criminal, do you? Not when I'm with you. And we'll always be with you, darling. Little Catherine and I. And we'll go with you any place, any time you wish. <laughs> night there was a storm and I woke to hear the rain lashing the window panes. Someone had knocked on the door. I got up quietly not to disturb Catherine and opened it. It was Emilio, the barman. Can I speak to Tenente? Oh, what's the matter, Emilio? It's a very serious matter. Well, what is it? Are you in trouble? No, you are Tenente. They're going to arrest you in the morning. Arrest me? I came to tell you. I was out in the town and I heard them talking in a cafe. They know you were here before as an officer and now you are here out of uniform after this retreat. They arrest everybody. Now, what time will they come? In the morning. I don't know the time. What do you say to do? Go to Switzerland. How? In my boat. The storm is over. It's rough, but you'll be all right. Go right away. They might come to arrest you very early. Well, what about our bags? Get them packed. Get your wife dressed. I'll take the bags out to seven sentences into the boat. You know what it is, Tenente? Yes, yeah, you showed me yesterday. Hurry, Tenente. Just walk out downstairs as though you were going for a walk. We got dressed and went out into the night. There was a cold, wet November wind, and I knew it was snowing in the mountains. We went down to the chained boats in the slips along the quay where I had seen the barman's little boat. Emilio stepped out from the shadows. Bags are in the boat, Tenente. I... I want to pay you for the boat. Send me the money later. That'll be all right. But how much, senor? What you wish. In the boat, a sandwich is in a bottle of beer. Well, let me pay you for those, then. All right. You give me 50 liters. But you better get in and let the lady be careful. Right? I will. Thank you. Darling, do you know where to go? Up the lake. You know how far? Past the Luino. Past Luino, Canero, Transan. The wind is with you, but you aren't in Switzerland until you come to Brissot. What time is it, darling? Well, it's only 11 o'clock. If you're all the time, you ought to be there by 7 o'clock in the morning. Is it that far? Uh, 35 kilometers. But when the wind is strong, use the big umbrella for a sail. It will help. Good luck to you, and send me some more American tobacco if you can. I will. Good luck to you. And thank you very much, senor. Good luck. Are you ready, Cat? Yes. I rode in the dark, keeping the wind in my face. The rain had stopped and only came occasionally in gusts. It was very dark, and the wind was cold. I think we're across the lake now, aren't we? I think so. I think I saw the lights of Palanza back there. How are you, darling? I'm fine. I could take the oil for a while. No, I'm fine. Call Ferguson. Mr. Morris will come to the hotel and find her gone. I'm not worrying so much about that. It's about getting into the swift part of the lake before it's daylight. Customs guard see us. Is it a long way yet? Yes. I'll hold the umbrella up for a while. Are you warm enough, Cat? I'm all right. Just a little stiff. Bail out that water and you can put your feet down. And you take a rest. I'll open a sandwich. You 
must be dead, darling. Let me row a while. I'm all right. My hands are sore as all. Let me row. I don't think you ought to. Nonsense. Rowing in moderation would be very good for me. When it was beginning to be daylight, we were quite close to the shore. I could see the trees dimly. John, what's that? Motorboat. Motorboat, probably customs guard. Whisper. Oh, no, darling. It mustn't be. Where are they? Turn of it. A move. Can they see us? I don't know. I can hardly see them. Looks like three of them in the boat. Maybe four. Pray, darling. Yes. Some of the brandy, will you? Of course, that's easy. We knew we were in Switzerland when it was clear daylight and we saw a Swiss soldier walking along the road skirting the shore. Presently, we came to a little town hunched around the road. There were many fishing boats along the quay and nets were spread on racks. I pulled hard on the oars and brought us alongside the quay. There was a soft November rain falling and we stood up to the wet stone and stood in Switzerland. That winter, we lived in a brown wooden house in the pine trees on the side of the mountain over Montreux, and it was very fine. By the middle of January, I had a beard, and the winter had settled into bright, cold days and hard, cold nights. We went for long walks, walking slowly and resting often because of little Catherine, and we read books and learned many two-handed card games. And at night, we always sat in front of a fire. Darling, why don't we have some ale tonight instead of tea? Very good for young Catherine. It's supposed to keep her small. Oh, <laughs> young Catherine, that loafer. She's been very good. She makes very little trouble. Of course she's good. I love your beard, darling. Such a great success. It looks so stiff and fierce, and it's very soft and a great pleasure. You really like it better than without? I think so. I like everything now, all of this. I never wanted to stop. How are we for money, darling? Oh, we have plenty. They honored the last sight draft. Won't your family want to hear what's happened now they know you're in Switzerland? Probably. I'll write them something. You'd better. You know, darling, I don't think I'll cut my hair now until after young Catherine's born. But afterwards, I'm going to cut it. And then I'll be a fine, new, and different girl for you. We'll go together and get it cut. Or I'll go alone and come and surprise you. You won't say I can't, will you? <laughs> no, I think it would be exciting. <laughs> Maybe I'd look lovely, darling, and be so thin and exciting to you, and you'll fall in love with me all over again. But I love you enough now. What do you want to do, ruin me? Yes, I want to ruin you. Good. That's what I want, too. All right, then. We had a splendid life. The winter was very beautiful, and we were very happy. There were short thaws when the wind blew warm and the snow softened and the air felt like spring. But always the clear, hard cold came again, and the winter returned. But at the end of March, the winter broke up, and it started raining. It won't be long now before young Catherine, darling. I know. And the weather's changing. We'd better move down into a little hotel in the town. Be near the hospital. Whatever you say. Darling, where will we go afterwards? Where would you like? To America. And then we'll all be Americans, won't we? That's the law. I looked it up. And you want to go to America? Yes, I want to see it with you. I want us to go to Niagara Falls. <laughs> You're a fine girl. And there's something else I want to see, but I can't remember it. Uh, Woolworth Building? No. The Grand Canyon? No, but I'd like to see that. Oh, what was it? The Golden Gate, that's what I want to see. Where, where is the Golden Gate? Oh, San Francisco. Then let's go there. Oh, darling, we're going to have a fine time, aren't we? We moved into a little hotel in the town and were very comfortable there. And then one morning in April, I took Catherine to the hospital. After a while, they sent me away and told me to come back later. I went down the empty streets and found a cafe that was open. I drank a little and talked to the old man who ran the place. And then I went back to the hospital. The doctor met me in the hall. You are Mr. Henry? Yes. How does it go, doctor? It does not go. What do you mean? Just that. I made an examination. Since then, I have waited to see. Now I think it is possible only with an operation. Yes. Well, what do you think, Doctor? I would advise an operation. Have I your permission? The sooner we operate now, the better. Operate as soon as you can. Thank you. I stood in the empty hall and watched the door of the operating room. 
what if she should die? No, but she wouldn't die, I thought. People don't die in childbirth nowadays. This was what all husbands thought. No, she won't die. She can't die. It's just nature. She can't die. But what if she should die? Mr. Henry, I'm sorry. The baby was born dead. It was a boy. How is she? She's all right. The doctor is with her now. You should go and try and have some supper and then come back if you wish. I went down the hall and then down the stairs and out the door of the hospital and down the dark street in the rain to the cafe. I sat at a corner table for a long time and then suddenly I knew I had to get back. I paid for whatever it was I had eaten and walked through the rain up to the hospital. Upstairs I met the nurse on the landing. I just called you at your hotel. What's wrong? Mrs. Henry had a hemorrhage. Can I go in? Not yet, no. The doctor is still with us. Hmm. Is it dangerous? It is very dangerous. The nurse went into the room and shut the door. I sat outside in the hall. Everything was gone inside of me. I didn't think I couldn't think. I knew she was going to die, and I prayed she would not. Don't let her die. Oh, God, please don't let her die. Please, please, dear God. The nurse opened the door and motioned for me to come. Catherine did not look up when I came in. I went over to the side of the bed. Catherine looked at me and smiled. I bent down over the bed and started to cry. Poor darling. You're all right, Catherine. You're going to be all right. I'm going to die. I hate it. You'll be all right, Catherine. I know you'll be all right. I meant to write you a letter to have if anything happened, but I didn't do it. You want me to get a priest or anyone to come and see you? Just. Just you, darling. I'm not afraid. I just hate it. You want me to do anything, Kat? Can I get you anything? No. You won't do our things with another girl. Or say the same things, will you? Never. You know I won't. I want you to have other girls, though. I don't want them. I am sorry you must not talk so much. Mr. Henry must go out. He can come back again later. All right. I'll be quite outside, Kat. Don't worry, darling. I'm not a bit afraid. It's just a dirty trick. I waited outside in the hall. I waited a long time. The doctor came to the door finally and came over to me. I am afraid Mrs. Henry is very ill. I am afraid for her. Is she dead? No, but she is unconscious. I went into the room and stayed with Catherine until she died. She was unconscious all the time, and it did not take her very long to die. I asked the doctor and the nurses to leave me alone in the room with her. But after I got them out and shut the door and turned off the light, it wasn't any good. It was like saying goodbye to a statue. After a while, I went out and left the hospital and walked back to the hotel in the rain. Tonight's version for listening was prepared by Fletcher Markle. The original musical score was composed by Lan Adomian and conducted by Cy Fewer. The Ford Theater, a full hour of dramatic entertainment, is brought to you each Friday by the Ford Motor Company, builder of Ford, Lincoln, and Mercury cars, Ford trucks, motor coaches, and farm tractors. Lincoln, America's most distinctive fine car. 
Mercury, smartest-looking car in its class. And in the lower price field, Ford, the only completely redesigned car and the most advanced car in its field. When you look at a new Ford, you'll see the difference. When you drive a new Ford, you'll feel the difference. And when you know the difference, you'll buy a new Ford. Now again, Mr. Martin. May the director identify the principals in our cast tonight. In the foreground... Catherine Barclay. ...was played and most magnificently played by Miss Helen Hayes. Rinaldi. ...was Everett Sloan. Ferguson. ...was played by Hester Sondergaard. Manera. ...was Robert Dryden. Gardini. ...was played by Hedley Rennie. Bacini. ...was Joe DeSantis. Actively assisting were Walter Black, Miriam Wolfe, Gregory Morton, and Alan Devitt. Lieutenant Frederick Henry was played by your director. Now it's the next week. Next week, we bring you the light-hearted romance of a famous writer and an unpredictable girl who, as her uncle said, didn't know her place. Our story is Clooney Brown by Marjorie Sharp. And our stars are Mr. Walter Pigeon of Hollywood and Miss Louine McGraw of the London Theater. We hope you'll be with us. Until next week, then, until Walter Pigeon and Louine McGraw in Clooney Brown, this is Fletcher Marple with a good night, and thank you from all of us in the Ford Theater. cordially invite you to join us again next Friday evening to hear Walker Pigeon and Louis McGraw in Clooney Brown. Nelson Case speaking, this is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. 7 p.m. B-U-L-O-V-A, Boulevard Watch Time.